This is Insights, the podcast of Forerunners of America, and I am Dave Warren, the director of Forerunners. Thank you so much for joining us with this vital topic. And we are diving deep today into the to Daniel 7, where Daniel unfolds, uh, explains the visions that he received from God related to four beasts and the fourth beast coming before Jesus' second coming. And to help me uh, unpack this and really give a now message for what we're seeing in America today, but also in the world today, because we do believe this is emerging right now. I have two great friends that are uh, are here with us, and so let me introduce Gary Crawford. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, David. And Gary is the president of Galatians 6-2, a nonprofit helping with ministries in this country and around the world in terms of, of all kinds of support type of help and, and just carries a, a now message uh, from his heart, which he has for many, many years. And then we also have once again with us Dave Brody from the Middle East. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks. And, and Dave Brody uh, has been in ministry his entire adult life. Uh, he and his wife are are laboring in, in God's vineyard and working hard with humanitarian work over in the Middle East and making a difference in lives and helping people. So awesome stuff, Dave. Thank you for joining us. I know it's evening your time, so thanks for staying awake for us. Well, we're going to jump in then right away here into Daniel 7, and this is so crucial because it will quickly, as we'll see here, connect uh, to Revelation 13. So all this is the foundation for our conversation later in this podcast where we're, we're talking about what actually is going on right now, what we're observing um, in the emergence of this fourth beast. But to really get there, we do need to take some time, uh, set the table a bit, have, have a foundation here. So Gary, could you jump in and just help us to understand what these first three beasts are all about in Daniel chapter 7? Yes, um, they speak of three kingdoms. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Daniel 7, Daniel actually asked for an interpretation. And uh, it's interesting that at the beginning of 7, um, just to note that it says it's, it's the four winds of heaven began to stir up the great sea, which is the earth, reference to the earth. So it's heaven itself is beginning to allow or permit the tumultuous times that basically become a prelude or a forecursor to the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. So you have this outworking of, of three, three beasts that he discusses in the first of these. And what's interesting, one other point before we talk about each of them also is that these beasts are still around at the time the fourth beast shows up. It says down in um, verse 12, as for the rest of the beasts, which it's referring to the first three, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So we know that even in the emergence of the fourth, the first three that it discusses that we're going to talk about here for a second are still on the earth. They're still around during the emergence of the fourth. And so one of the things that's why that's important is because I think he's giving us clues a little bit to the identity of, of what this is happening. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the, so that we're moving up to the time of the second coming of Christ. And uh, I believe that the three beasts, beginning with the first one of the lion, is a description of the British Empire, which was, up until prior to World War I, was a major uh, empire, obviously. They influenced India, the Middle East, all kinds of places. With, um, But it was an economic empire for the most part. It didn't have necessarily, while it did have military involved, it didn't have the military destruction that you quite see in the next two beasts. Uh, the bear, which we believe to be the Russian Empire, Soviet, the emergence of the Soviet Union, Bolshevik Revolution in the late 1900s, or early 1900s, I should say. And then the leopard beast, which is the third to be Germany, Nazi Germany, um, um, in terms of three empires that emerged. And, and by the way, like I said, all three of those are still around. Great Britain is still here, Germany is still here, and the Russian, the Russian uh, although it's been broken up to a certain extent, that group is still on the planet to this day. And so pulling those together um, is important because we see those, and we'll talk about this emergence of the force in a few minutes, but we're moving towards the return of Christ, which is all in this vision of Daniel 7. 
So we, we know that we can reverse engineer from knowing that that's going to occur with a great certainty. As a matter of fact, the day has been chosen. But as we look backwards from that point and see events that are unfolding in front of us, which Thessalonians, Hebrews remind us, as you see the day drawing near, God gives us instructions about what we're to be doing. But he's, he's, he's presuming in that and in the scriptures that while we don't know the day or the hour of Christ's return, we certainly can see the season of events that lead up to that return. And that's the thing the church should be aware of. And I'm very concerned that we're not seeing the day and hour we're living in. And oh, by the way, it has real world implications, practical implications on our lives right now today in the body of Christ. Yes, getting ready for Jesus' second coming and longing for his second coming. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, as John put it. But also we need to navigate this. We need to navigate this world and and have the great hope in Jesus' second coming. But there is a lot of stuff that's going to be very challenging as we look at this fourth beast here in a few minutes, and many things that need to be digested now and not be like uh, uh, the last one to the party in trying to figure this out when things really get intense. So I, I just want to emphasize the nowness of this. Now, before we get on to all of that, Gary, you just mentioned the lion being the British Empire. Those that rank this, in, and as I have, anybody can look this up online, the greatest empires in all of world war history. They go by uh, the number of people that were ruled over during those empires or kingdoms. They go with the land mass. They go with influence. Uh, pretty much those three areas, but uh, other things too, like economics, which will be part of influence. But anyway, the British Empire, the lion at the beginning of Daniel 7, it is the 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 largest empire in all of human history. And doesn't that sound like our God to include the largest empire? He knew it was coming. He knew it would unfold and he includes it in the Bible. Well, then, um, you know, we look at the line, it says its wings were removed. And I can't help but to think, meaning the wings of an eagle is what it says. I cannot help to, but to think this has got impl- implications of 1776 when America uh, declares its independence and we go into the Revolutionary War. The wings of that lion that would have truly propelled it like the wings of an eagle into a whole nother stratosphere, if I could put it that way, it doesn't happen as big as the British Empire grew. It never happened because the wings of the eagle became America. And then it goes on from there to talk about the bear, as you, as you just said, and talk about a ruthless empire in the Russian um, empire. Now, more from the time of the Bolshevik revolution and Lenin getting into power here in the 20th century and then going on into Stalin and so forth, more from that point forward, but also that the empire, the Russian empire prior to that, it's considered the third largest empire in human, human history. And, and then we get on to, as you said, the third, the leopard being uh, Germany, probably I would think representing Germany, uh, Nazi Germany in terms of a leopard strength, speed, and how in the, the four areas of its military, uh, how the strength and speed of Nazi Germany just went forth and so forth. So it's very intriguing to me. I've heard more of the traditional approach to Daniel 7, which connects it to Daniel 2. I personally do not believe that that's probably the the correct or dominant interpretation that we would go with for Di- Daniel 7, Daniel 2 being Jesus' first coming, Daniel 7 being Jesus' second coming. But nevertheless, it's fascinating to me what you just said, Gary, the British, the Russian, and the... Um, and the, the influence of Nazi Germany is still very strong today, just like it says uh, there in verse, uh, verses 11 and 12. So, so, Gary, what do you do with people who are just like, well, this is beyond us, whether it's Daniel 7 or the book of Revelation is so confusing. I'll never figure it out. You know, like, what do you say to that kind of sentiment? The same thing I did when I, when I asked, when I pondered and when you muse on things in Scripture, I started asking my father. Um, Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, what, how do I, I need understanding in this hour? And says, he said, whoever asks, he'll give wisdom liberally. I mean, so I don't think it's a problem, but unbelief will block your use of faith to receive what you need from heaven in this hour. Because if you don't believe you can know this, or if you shouldn't, then he says it's impossible to come to God unless you believe he exists. 
So as a Christian, if you don't believe that you can go to your Heavenly Father and receive information or revelation about the hour you live in, then He can't give it to you because you won't apply by faith. He, he, he's a good Father who will give us understanding, but I would say to the church, one, you better get in the Scriptures, because there are things that the church is, it's, the church is, has much it can be about in this hour. The righteous, the, the saints, the, the white robe of the saints that were given in the late revelation, I forget what chapter 19 or whatever it is, were the righteous acts of the saints. We are to be doing and about God's business in this hour. That's what Hebrews 10 says, stirring each other up to love and good works as you see the day approaching. So in other words, there is vision that we're seeing it coming. We know that we need to be stirring each other up so our love does not grow cold. Remember, Jesus said the love of many is going to grow cold in those days. Matthew 24. And we need to be saying, okay, God, what do you want us to do? So we get together with Dave and Dave, and we begin to talk and say, how do I stir myself up? Um, uh, how do we stir each other up to this? Does that make right. sense? Uh, right, yeah. You know, there's so much of this that has to do with it's in the Bible not because God was put in there to confuse us, but because he put it there to clarify things for us. So as Absolutely. we enter in, we actually anticipate. And as I said at the outset here, I think there are some very difficult days ahead for a variety of reasons that we've hit on other podcasts, but specifically on this topic, the fourth beast, which we're just about to get to now, um, this is not going to be uh, uh, an easy ride or uh, some light turbulence, if you want to put it that way. There is very serious things. And, and just before we go there, Gary, I want to jump back to what you said a minute ago about just the expectation in Scripture that we'd understand. It does say uh, Jesus is talking at the end of Luke 12, and he's just aghast that he's looking at people in that generation where here the Messiah has come the first time. And he's saying, how is it that you understand the weather patterns and you can observe and make discernment with that, but how is it that you do not understand the times uh, of what's taking place right now? And then skipping over to Luke 19, he t he's weeping over Jerusalem because they did not understand the time, and they were supposed to. And I believe that that if there was ever a time to kind of catch what's going on globally, and the fourth beast is a global thing that happens, it's right now. It's right now for the body of Christ to lock into what's going on globally and make connections here with the scriptures. So um, I, I'm sorry, Dave, we might have uh, uh, dominated here the last few minutes. Is there anything that you want to throw in, whether it's the first, the three beasts, or just whatever? Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, there seems to be a growing uh, shift of a number of people I've known, at least, towards amillennialism. You know, just, just kind of this respectable interpretation of prophecy that says it's all historical, it's all allegorical. I think it's there's two reasons behind that. One is it is true that some in the church jumped the gun on some prophetic things and maybe went too far, and that that kind of put some people off, and they they just decide to forget it. I'm just going to play it safe and and have this other position. And the other one is just a desire of many people to be politically correct and be respectable. And you know, if you're talking about the Antichrist and all this stuff, you're you're not exactly um, you know, a, a respectable, worldly sort of person that's going to fit into the mainstream. And so some people don't are afraid to go off into these sort of things. So I think a number of people are missing the boat. They don't see what's going on. They've kind of plugged their own ears and they don't see the signs of the times. They don't see the trends, which are obvious to me. We're getting so close. Amen. Right. So with that, let me shift this, which I think is a clear... Um, shift that the that God makes from Daniel 7 to Revelation chapter 13. So now we're clearly in the end times. I think we already were um, just looking at Daniel 7, but now if we connect it to Revelation 13, the whole book being about Jesus' second coming and what happens prior, I think we're clearly locating Daniel 7 in the end time scenario. So let me read just a couple verses here because it's this same beast that's going to show up. Now, um, I should say in Daniel 7, it says, it says this, and we'll put it on the screen for those getting the, the uh, YouTube and, and Rumble versions. But 
But Daniel says this in Daniel chapter 7, verse, uh, starting in verse 7, After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different than all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. And so uh, most scholars would say, here we have the emergence of the Antichrist, and he supplants three kings, and he's got more power at this point. But notice that this one, it's a fourth beast, and it says it's different than the first three, but it, but what we're going to see here in Revelation 13, it includes the first three. So let me just read this from Revelation chapter 13. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems or crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Now get this and think about Daniel 7, which we just covered. It says... And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, the speed and the strength of something like Nazi Germany. And it says, and his feet were like those of a bear. And the Russian bear, again, uh, in the empire, but moving on into uh, into its Marxist communist um, ideology and onward through Stalin from World War II through that and onward. It, it crushed people. It crushed nations. It was ruthless, uh, almost beyond anything we can imagine. So we have now the bear, and it says, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Well, what did the British Empire bring the world? The British Empire brought the English language to the world. So it's very interesting to me how God does this. Before Jesus' first coming, he brought Koine Greek. And it prepared, it was a trade language for all the nations to use. So when the gospel showed up, Jesus shows up, they can quickly move the gospel from nation to nation through Koine Greek. God does the same thing now through having, let's just call it, the worldwide trade language of English that's, uh, you know, so prevalent today. He does that through the British Empire. So all of these empires are still existing right now, as we already covered. And then it goes on to say, And the dragon, Satan, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I think we need to be mindful that, yes, we know who wins in the end, but the Bible says he didn't give him a modicum or a modicum of authority. It says he gave him great authority. And so this is a a formidable opponent, even though we know that who wins and what happens to the people of God. He goes on to say, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and it it had a fatal wound and it was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. So this is going to be a worldwide phenomenon as this goes on. And I think that's what we're beginning to see right now, even though most people don't understand scripturally the beast, the inner dynamics. But I think that that's what we're actually seen emerge right now is this fourth terrifying beast that is different than all the other beasts. So I was listening to a podcast that Michelle Bachman did the other day talking about a meeting that is going on with Geneva. And I think it's the World Monetary Council or something. I'm not sure it's got some name, but um, they have votes uh, and things that they're trying to promote to basically use a uh, one world government. They're not hiding it any longer. There's open discussion about a one world government, about one currency that, so one day your currencies could be turned off and they would give to you back what they think you need uh, to live on. And hmm. so you're saying that and their ability to seize assets electronically has already been proven by what they've done with Russia and the Ukraine conflict. Uh, Crete, I think it was 2017 or 2018, froze the assets and all you could get was $25 a day out of your bank account. Hmm. So it's they, already happened. This isn't theory. They know how to do this. That, they know how to do it. it it's not, this is not like uh, Star Wars. They, they know how to do it. So... Right. You know, it it was interesting to me, there was a recent meeting in Dubai as well, and it was called Global 
Government 2022. It was another one of these meetings right out in the open to try to organize this. Now, what we're saying here, both with these kinds of global governance types of, of organizations coming together, as well as what uh, you're talking about like a, a currency that could be turned off on. That's exactly what we would expect from a fourth beast. That this fourth beast is going to have this ability to micromanage everybody on the planet. Talk about Big Brother in a way that we've never even really grasped it before. This, I believe, is why Daniel calls it the terrifying beast. It's terrifying because it will be able to control you. And I don't think we've also appreciated sometimes this term totalitarianism. This fourth beast, you could summarize it, I believe, as totalitarian in a way that's never been seen in human history. Yeah, governments love cashlessness because it gives them control. They can, can, they can monitor you. They can tax you. They can... They can, you know, stop payments, whatever they want to do ultimately. So these digital c currencies are interesting because, you know, probably for a few decades, people have advocated or suggested or warned uh, uh, people about what happens if we ever go cashless. And they'll know every expenditure you ever, ever made. And this is significant because it says in Revelation that believers will not be able to buy and sell because we're not following the beast. Talk about a practical implication that we need to be thinking about right now. But cashless, is it's true. But now that we have digital currencies, it's the pathway. If we go into a full digital currency without cash, they will know everything about you right to the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest detail. You know, one friend of mine, I used to be in India for a while, and a friend of mine who was out there said, well, how can you have this you know, cash society? Look at us here in India where you know, we're just using cash. No one uses cards and that sort of thing. Well, then I think it was 2016, the prime minister of India suddenly said, you know, these higher rupee notes would no longer be used. We, we're going to get rid of corrupt currency. And so suddenly we had all these notes we couldn't use and we had to go change them in the bank. And it was a... And they, they said it was to you know to come against corruption, but as has progressed, they we finally began to get the messages from the government and others: go cashless, go cashless, go cashless, and it worked to a degree. More Indians went cashless, and they pushed more people in that direction. So I could see the trend. Right, and I think we have to be very careful right now about um, Gary. The term you, I've heard you use uh, in the past is a salt lick, and it's, you know, uh, a deer would come in and lick the salt, and then you have an easy target for, for the deer hunter. But the point being is, is that the, everything is being sold to us on a global scale, and now Dave was even just talking about India, but everything's being sold to us, that it's for our own good. It's going to stop corruption. It's going to stop um, uh, uh, sinister plants, whatever, but it's, it's just coming at us in such a way that it sounds like these are things we want, which in the end, they monitor us or they, they take over us or they take away our rights. Yeah. And I guess part of it is we're trying to give people an exhortation, so to speak. You can discern these times and you can know what to do like that Menevisicar did. You can sit and complain about these times, but Jesus said they must take place. So the issue is not really getting wound up about what's going on. I think it's wise to understand the schemes of the enemy that he is bringing about. But the bigger question for me has been, Lord, what do you want me to do in Sour? I mean, Noah was a preacher of righteousness right up until the doors of the ark were closed. And I think the church needs to stand up and begin to say the king is coming and not be afraid of that. I, I was with my granddaughter this morning who were babysitting, and she was given a pictorial Bible um, that she's kind of goes all the way back to Genesis and goes through every book from picture. But it was interesting because I had forgotten that there was a picture there that had Noah saying, the flood is coming. And then it had the picture of the people that were down around him saying, oh, you're you don't know what you're talking about. Noah's building an ark in the middle of nowhere. And they're mocking him. And I had forgotten the fact that it says Noah was building the ark, but he was a preacher of righteousness. And I think it's time for the church to open its mouth that the king is, and we're going to get mocked. They're going to say, where is his coming? And what's it saying, Timothy? You've been talking about that for thousands of years. It's not yeah. going to happen. And Second Peter 3 says the same. So I, I, 
it's yes, these things are happening. Yes, there's corruption in the government. To Dave's point, you know, they used to use script, I think, in the Korean War, where you'd have green script, red script. In other words, they pick a day and they change it because they knew people were manipulating the money thing. But now that governments have become corrupt, they're using it, to Dave's point, for just total control. Um, they're basically pulling the strings on the puppet thing. And so I don't know that I can do anything about that, but I know that God has responsibilities for us and the church per se in the as hours to get ready, because if he didn't cut these days short, it says no flesh would survive. So right. <laughs> right. He's, so I'll buckle up and be ready for quite a ride. Yeah. Um, so I got to interject here. Many of the things we're talking about here, it's what you would expect by, as the term you used at the outset, Gary, by reverse engineering or looking at what's happening. These are the kinds of things we would expect from a fourth terrifying beast that the that the world has never seen before. Um, you know, we're talking about a, a cashless society. We're talking about the things that Michelle Bachman uh, brought up. Now, I, I do want to go further with Michelle Bachman, though. She was, she's the former congresswoman from Minnesota, but she's a very credible source, and she has been in the news more recently. And and she was sounding this alarm. She said, and again, this is something we would expect to come from the fourth beast. So let's be ready, and let's not get into that mindset of, well, we'll never understand anything. What's the point? I think that that group is going to get blindsided. But anyway, this is a, a Gateway Pundit article um, from, uh, from May 12th, 2022. And it's saying in 10 days, about the time that this podcast is being put out there, it says on May 22nd through 28th, ultimate control over America's health care system and hence its national sovereignty will be delivered for a vote to the World Health Organization's governing legislative body, which is called the World Health Assembly. Every time we see this, this word world, we should, it should pick up our, 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 um, our, our, our spiritual eyesight, our, our, our ears, our radar, because because as you read later in Daniel 7, when Daniel asked the angel to interpret the fourth beast, it's very clear that this is a global beast. That's one of the ways that this uh, empire is different than all of the others. Because even the British Empire, which was the greatest in history, it only had like 24% of the land mass of the earth. This one, it covers the entire globe. And so anyway, but it goes on to say this that this threat with giving our healthcare system over to the World Health Organization, it says this threat is contained in new amendments to the World Health Organization's international health regulations proposed by the Biden administration that are scheduled as provisional agenda item 16.2 at the um upcoming conference on May 22nd through the 28th. If passed, the Biden administration's proposed amendments will, by their very existence and their intention, drastically compromise the independence and the sovereignty of the United States. The same threat looms over all the UN's 193 member nations, all of whom belong to the WHO and represent 99.44% of the world's population. I mean, I hope that nobody feels like this is a stretch. Like this is the kind of global governance that a fourth beast that again is global would have to do. And indeed I believe is happening right now. And so many things that happened with COVID and, and this is another outplay, what we're talking about here with the world health organization. Many of these things are exactly what a, a fourth beast as we're reading about in the Bible would try to accomplish. Yeah. They always try and sneak these things in. And uh, most people, aware of what's going on right now with them trying to bring in that that regulation yeah i i agree i um the good news is and it's in daniel 7 also um he will seek to change times and things but god's not going to permit him to so the good news for the believer is understanding that god controls the narrative of even what he's permitting satan to do and orchestrate and that we can never lose sight of that uh because if we do, we've made Satan to be greater in power and strength than our God. Right. And I think we want to walk that line in terms of um, we want to not live in fear at all. We, and we don't want to suggest that somehow Satan 
changes timelines or events. At the same time, I think it's pretty clear that the body of Christ needs to wake up. Like, are we really seeing the day and hour that we're living in? And by the way, it should be very encouraging because lift up your eyes, your redemption draweth nigh. And I can't say it's going to happen this year or next year or this decade or, or when, but like we said earlier, it's a season. And this is, I believe this is such a now message that we need to be uh, talking about, but also then, um, you know, again, responding in faith by preparing, by preparing for a cashless society, because it says that we will not be able to buy or sell. I, I'm not sure that many Christians are are ready for that today, as well as seeing other things that have come out, like uh, you know, the the um, uh, the pandemic and different things. That I would say that the response could you could actually go as a Christian in a very worldly response, or you could go in a more godly, faith filled response. And I think we want to be ready for things that will be much greater than COVID nineteen. Yeah, I, uh, you know, you think back to when he came the first time and as he came into Jerusalem, he wept over the city, as you said. I, I know that you all and most of the church, we don't want Jesus to weep at his second coming because the church, his bride, was not ready for him when he came. Uh, obviously, it grieved him that his own people didn't recognize him. And it's very possible that those 10 virgins, not all of them were ready. And there is ample evidence that just because we're Christians, we're not bulletproof to what God is doing on the earth. We have to be away to it. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's what I would think grieves his heart would be the most, that his, his own bride is not ready or away to what he's doing. And can I add one other aspect to that? Is the bride right now, are we in America, as Christians in America, are we longing for his second coming? This is the greatest day that we could ever talk about, hope for, anticipate. And I'm not sure we are. I mean, honestly, I've been to a variety of churches during my adult lifetime, sometimes a regular attender member, uh, sometimes just visiting on that particular Sunday. And I'm not sure we're really like uh, anticipating the greatest upcoming event uh, uh, of human history, Jesus' second coming. I'm not sure the anticipation is there. It is interesting as you read Revelation and Daniel, it's these end time events are very much tied in in the description with the second coming, with 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 the with with Jesus returning. So that that should be something that's uh, close to our hearts. Right. And I think if we understand the gospel, I think if we understand the, the story of the entire Bible's scriptures, that uh, that we could be even fitting into this right now. It should really uh, be something that we should stir our faith. I mean, we should be, uh, I, I love, you know, the definition of the word enthusiasm. <laughs> enthusiasm means in God, theo and in God, like, wow. And we could be experiencing him face to face here um, soon is awesome. Now, I want to kind of circle back before we close off today, but there's just other things that I think we would expect from a fourth beast, such as what we're talking about. Um, uh, I do want to, before I read this next thing, I want to go back to, um, again, the Russian bear. It tramples the the kind of atrocities, ruthlessness of, of the Russians in, in behind the Iron Curtain. It's unbelievable. It's hard to even describe, and we're not taking time to do that today. But it's interesting to me that in Revelation 13, the, which is the fourth beast of Daniel 7, the feet, the, what actually does the trampling, which actually wears down the saints, it says in Daniel 7, it's actually this Russian bear, which I believe is definitely connected to um, communism, to Marxist ideology. Sometimes that's pr uh, expressed as progressivism, all these kinds of things. But nevertheless, in the end, it's ruthless. And... Um, this is another area now I want to bring up that I think we would expect from an emerging fourth beast of Daniel 7 in Revelation 13. And that is, he, Satan is the father of lies, so he's got to limit the flow of information. And what's been in the news here just in the last few weeks is Elon Musk uh, buying out Twitter. Because he said in his own words, he sees Twitter, what it could be, what it's not, because they, they censor voices and, and take people down. But he wants it to be... The market square of, you know, uh, the term from, from the old days that we're a market square and any idea counts and you can talk and anybody can say anything. Elon Musk wants to bring this back to Twitter. And yet the kind of response that has just 
escalated here recently, uh, a few weeks ago, with the uh, disinformation governance board that um, that President Biden has uh, appointed uh, um, a leader to to head this up. And it's like, wait a second, we're just finally moving back into how America's always been with free speech and let's share ideas to, oh, no, you're not allowed to say certain things. And we're in a situation where if you have a father of lies, uh, what Jesus called Satan, he's got to limit the truth or distort the truth or, or censor the truth. And that is exactly what's happening. And I guess what I'm, I'm so like... Um, um, overwhelmed by is Elon Musk now is being investigated by our own government for various reasons as he tries to carry through the deal. But, but Elon Musk is trying to do something that's been typically just very American, very accepted as a good thing. And now, oh no, it could push disinformation. We could not allow that. And he, even Elon said just here the other day, don't dis information, meaning we need the information out there. Don't diss it out of hand. And it seems like if we're not going with the narrative that we are being uh, more and more silenced, which again is a characteristic of this fourth beast. You know, I just want to throw in one thing here and, um, and then either of you guys, final comment, we're close, closing down our podcast for today. But here's another huge thing to keep on our radar because it's already here. We're not talking about something that could happen, but it's already here and growing by the day. And that is living in a surveillance society. Now, I know we touched on this earlier, but in terms of being able to track people, and Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin just brought this up the other day, that why was there so much going on over the last two years that was tracking Americans through their the pings on their phone, not for COVID reasons. Now, some of it was COVID reasons, some of it not, but the, here's the point. Uh, we are moving headlong into a situation where a fourth beast, the one world government, uh, however this plays out, where this thing could track us. Now, why is that so significant? Most people say, well, I never do anything wrong. Let them track me. Here's, again, we're right back to the Soviet Union and the evil that happened behind that Iron Curtain. They tortured people for two things. One, it had to be Marxist ideology, which means you have to give all of your allegiance to the government, not to a religion. And uh, it was a lot of Christians, but I want to be clear, not only Christians that were persecuted um, during that time under under Stalin and afterwards. Now, the other thing they wanted is the names of other people that were either government resistors or were also people of faith. They wanted to completely uh, destroy faith, destroy capitalism, and they, they had to get so uh, focused on it. But, it was fairly difficult to do that, especially if when you're torturing somebody, they don't talk. Today, because of surveillance society, they already have all of our names, period. And, I mean, there might be one person out there somewhere in Idaho that's off the grid. Well, good for you. But the point is that this surveillance it's the very thing that Lenin and Stalin and their successors needed to take that the rest of the way. Well, guess what's happening? Exactly what the fourth beast needs. He's got the surveillance in place. And I think wake up, open your eyes, but not only to that threat, but as we said a little bit ago, open your eyes, lift up your eyes, your redemption draweth nigh. All right. Well, Gary, any final comment or Dave, uh, any final comment? Two thoughts. Um, first of all, just based on what you just said, what I am very joyful about, God has my name. And so mm -hmm. I don't care if the government knows about it. And like and like the demon who turned to the men of Cephas and said, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, you guys, I don't. One of the most important things for Christian is to make sure you're known by the Father because he's the one who holds the keys to this. One last thing is that I've been pondering is in Zechariah chapter 10, it talks about the restoration of Judah and Israel. And it says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. And I believe the church needs to call out for the Bokash, which I understand in the Jewish is the latter rain is greater than the former rains of Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh because there's a great harvest. And I've been pondering as a believer, do I, I need to ask my father for the rain in the season of the latter rain? Because I believe we're in that season also. 
Yeah, we got to do a podcast on that because I believe with greater difficulty comes greater anointing or what you're describing as the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. I believe that both will continue to escalate. Great word on both of those points, Gary. And Dave Brody, final word. Yeah, in John 9, 4, it says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one man should work. So uh, the second coming that we know is getting closer should really be an impetus for us to do the works of God as, as best we can. It was a servant who thought his master was long in coming, who was lazy, but the one who knew he was coming soon uh, would work harder. Good word. Amen. Right on. And thank you, Dave. And thank you, Gary, for joining me here on Insights. And I just want to say to everyone that we've done the best we can to warn you, but also to help respond in faith. We're here every time on Insights to warn you of everything that's going on in the scriptures in the world today, as well as help you to respond in faith. Lift up your eyes. Your redemption draweth nigh.